These students are here and they're going to be used by God this week. But I believe today John wants us to see how our love will lead us to some significant commitments. You see, our love for Jesus leads us to commitment. Let's pray, church. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for every person that is here. God, whether it is their very first time or the first time in a long time, whether they grew up in this church or they go to a different church across the valley, I pray, God, that you would bless our time together and that you would be working in our lives, that your Holy Spirit would be allowing us to become more like the image of your Son. God, we surrender to what you want to do today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church family, we've been in the middle of this series called Love Leads. And we've been taking a look at how Jesus' love demonstrated for us how we're to call to live our lives and how as a follower of Christ, our love should lead us to live in specific ways. We said love leads us to share. Love leads us to live in unity with each other as brothers and sisters of Christ. Love leads us to live in the light and to allow the holiness, the righteousness of God to reveal in us the areas of our life that he wants to change. We're looking at all of these different things from the book of First John. So if you have your phone, pull it out, open up the Version app. If you have a physical Bible with you today, that is awesome. You're going to be able to underline. You're going to be able to circle. And if you have no Bible whatsoever, we got you because this is a place where we are so excited that you're here. You don't need to bring anything to come be a part of a service at NBC. We'll have it on the up on the screen. If you are right now on NBC online, you're going to see the verses that are going to pop up right there by our amazing volunteers. And so open up to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to see one of the first commitments that love leads us to make. I believe that we see from 1 John chapter 2 that love leads us to make a commitment to our church family. Love leads us to make a commitment to a church family. Now, now where, where do I get that from and why do I say it? Well, let's look at it. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. I'll, I'll start reading right here. Uh, John starts out and he says this, Dear children, how many times have we seen this church, right? It's like, dear children, dear family, dear love. He constantly is using these familial terms because he's writing to his church family. He's writing to this group of churches that he had done ministry with, and he's writing back to them, and he's instructing them and saying, these are the ways, as followers of Christ, we should live. This is the way the church should look. So this is very applicable to your life and mine. As we're a part of a church family, he's writing, he's saying, Dear children, the last hour is here. Now, when he's saying that, he's saying this because Jesus has died and rose again and gone back up to be with the Father. So the next thing that they're waiting for is Jesus' return. So he's saying, the last hour is here. We don't know when this hour is going to come. We don't know when Jesus is going to return. But he's saying, Dear children, the last hour is here, the time. We are living in anticipation of Jesus Christ's return. The last hour is here. He continues on. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. Now, this is important here. There's a differentiation here, right? He says the Antichrist is coming, this biblical figure that we see in Revelation chapter 13. He said, this is coming into the future. But he's saying, but right now, there are also Antichrists. Now, what does anti mean, church? Against, like, that's easy. So those who are against, and who are they against? Christ. So he's saying, not only is there an Antichrist that is going to come at the end of the age, but he's saying, there are those who are living in direct opposition to the mission and ministry and the identity of Jesus Christ. And he begins to, go, begins to explain that later on throughout this book, but right here he's going to define it some more. He says this, For this we know that the last hour has come. These people, those people who were antichrists who have appeared, these people left our churches. Can you underline that if you have a physical Bible right there? These people have left our churches. Now remember the point I said at the beginning was love leads us to have a commitment to a local body, a family, a church. See, it was very different in the early church. 
in the early church, when you became a part of this body of believers, you lived there in unison with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You weren't coming and going. If there was a disagreement, that's okay. You lived in the disagreement. You lived in the tension. As they were part of the early church, there were people who were part of the church. Remember, Christianity is not hundreds, thousands of years old. They were working through so many of these things. They had not yet even received all of the letters from the apostles. And so they're working in this tension of the early church. And so those who are part of the early church, they live together in unity, in community, in fellowship. That's why this point is such a big deal, because this wasn't normal. We've kind of normalized it in the church. John is saying something very different. He's saying this, these people left our churches, our body of believers, but, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. I mean, that, that's getting pretty powerful right there, right? He's saying these people who are anti, against Christ, have left the church, they've rem self-removed themselves, and they did not stay there. They no longer wanted to affiliate or be a part of the church. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. Now, I don't want us to draw too many conclusions because, again, remember, this is being written to a specific audience. So maybe some of us in the room were immediately beginning to think of, ooh, well, that person, or this person, or that person. Well, we're right here. John is talking about a very specific group of people, and we're going to learn a little bit more about who this group of people is in just a few minutes. But rather than focusing on the Antichrist, let's focus on the principle that John is laying out here, and he's applying to the early church, and he's saying, if you are a part of the early church, they did not leave our church. They stayed together in fellowship, in community. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a gym membership? Raise your hand if you've ever got a gym membership. All around the room, hands go up. Okay. I'm not going to ask how many of you still have that gym membership. Because what do we do with those things? We cancel them, right? We realize after three months in, we're like, you know what? I've only gone twice. I'm spending way too much money to just feel good about myself. And so we cancel it. How many of you have ever had uh, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime? Like you've had some type. All right, back there, Kimberly, I see the hand. Well, raise your hand if you've ever had any type of streaming service subscription. All right, all right. I see hands going up all over the place. Now, that one you didn't cancel. You just borrowed somebody else's username and password, right? <laughs> no, like if finances get tight, cancel. Like that's kind of the American way, right? Something doesn't go my way. I get tired of that show and I can't find another one I like. What do I do? I cancel it. I stopped attending my gym. I stopped seeing those games. So I cancel it. Get rid of that. What if that mindset has permeated the church? I no longer like what they're saying, so I you know what, I haven't been in a few weeks, so I, you know what, it's just not the music I wanted, so I, the church is the bride of Christ. God designed us to live in community and fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. This is why love leads us to this commitment. This is why this is such a big deal that First John's talking about here. He's saying these people, they left because they were opposed to Christ. Maybe we've begun to view church as something we can just cancel. But the reality is church is not a service. It's not something you just stop attending. Church is not a building that you stop going to. Church is a group of people that we are a part of. It's a family. And we may get disconnected for a season. We may step away for a period of time, but we are still called to be a part of the family. Now, here's the beautiful thing. There's a beautiful diversity of churches. And I want you to hear this, church. You will never tell me you have to, you will never hear me tell you you need to be a member here at NBC. 
because there is a beautiful diversity of churches. And if God leads you away to a different church, I'm totally good with that. I will celebrate that as long as you don't leave the church. The church is the bride of Christ. If God leads you away, don't disconnect from the church. Now, I would love for you to be here because I happen to love this place. I happen to love the people here, but the reality is this is not going to be the place for everyone. We are a multi-generational, multi-racial church that is seeking to reach this community. And so I want to give you permission that at any point, if you don't feel like this is the church for you, that's okay, but do not leave the body and bride of Christ. Stay connected and have a commitment to the church. Because each church is built around a different mission. E each church is given a mission and a purpose that they are called to achieve based on the people that are in that body, based on the leadership of that church, based on so many different dynamics. And inside of that, we must hold true to that mission. And that leads to our second point. We must make a commitment to truth. We're going to make a commitment to our church family, and then we're going to make a commitment to truth. And that's what John begins to explain right here. He goes from this first part of talking about, all right, there was these antichrists and they left, uh, but these are the ones who remain. And he says, but this is, this is what's important. It's because truth was what was the dividing factor. Read, follow here. This is what it says. But you, remember, he's writing to the church. He's not writing to the Antichrist. He's not trying to inform them. He's not trying to debate them. No, but you, the church, are not like that. For the Holy One has given you his spirit. And all of you know the truth. So he gives us here the reason why he's writing. So I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. This body of believers, he's saying, must be committed to the pursuit of truth. You and I, we must remain committed to truth. This is so important in the life of the believer that we are on this constant journey to understand and to be committed to truth. As we walk through life, as we grow, as we follow Christ, now, why is this such a big deal? Because right now, inside of this story, as we're leading and as we're following along, we could see, as he begins to explain it, he says this, and who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, Jesus is not the Christ. I mean, John's like, he's calling them under the carpet. He's saying, no, they are a liar. Why? Anyone who denies the Father and Son is an anti Christ. They're living in opposition to Jesus Christ, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our hope, the foundation of our identity as followers of Christ. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. This is an essential belief for us, church. The identity of Jesus Christ is an essential belief. This is the exact belief the Antichrists were attacking. The identity, the deity, the humanity of Jesus Christ. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So we need some historical context here, right? It's like, okay, so like what went on here? Well, there was a group of people, these antichrists, who had left the church. They were considered Gnostics. Now, depending on which commentary, depending on which theologian you listen to, there are so many different beliefs about, okay, what exactly did this group of Gnostics that left these churches believe? But the general principle is that they were undermining the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. So they were saying, while Jesus lived on the earth, at one point he was fully deity and fully humanity, at another point he wasn't. But we know from the teachings of Scripture that Jesus was fully God, fully man. That he was God in the flesh, God in a bod. Jesus was fully God and fully man because that's what Jesus said. I don't have to take that from anybody else. The person who predicted his own death and resurrection and then pulled it off told me, I am God in the flesh. I am fully man. I am fully God. So if I'm going to believe anybody, I'm going to believe the words of Jesus. That settles it for me. But these antichrists were attacking this truth. 
These Gnostics were attacking this truth. And the reality is in today's world, oh, let me read one more passage. I'm going to explain this a little bit further, and then I'm going to go on to this next point. 2 John 2, 7, John expands on it a little bit more in the next book that he wrote. He says this, I say this because many deceivers have gone into this world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. This is the tension. This is the theological precept that is in battle right here. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. See, this is, this is such an important thing for us to know and to believe, church. Because there are so many other religions that may have great morals, that may contribute to a better society, but may not believe in the Jesus Christ that you and I worship and surrender our lives to. He's a prophet. He's a good teacher. He's a moral man. No, he is God in the flesh. This is the point and source of our salvation. This is our eternal hope. Jesus Christ alone. And so as we're talking and as we're learning, we must come back to this essential belief, the identity of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension to be with the Father, preparing a home for us for eternity. You must know what you believe. Here's the reality. You don't have to have it all figured out today. But we should be on this journey where we're committed to know what we believe. But guess what? Here's the cool part. You're not alone. You should be on that journey. But we as a church should also know what we as a church believe. This is essential. When we're part of a body of believers, we want to know what does that body of believers believe. And for us, when you go through our, our membership class, we go and we talk about three different categories. And I want to just give you a small introduction to these three different categories and how we view this truth as a church body, as a church family. The first thing, that in essential beliefs, we have unity. That means this, this belief of the identity of Jesus Christ, we have unity. That means every person that says, okay, I am a follower of Christ. I want to be a member. I want to be a part of this body of believers. If we want to have you be a part of this body of believers, we would ask when you become a member that you agree with these essential beliefs. Now, much to contrary opinion, not every theological belief is an essential belief. There are beliefs that are non-essential beliefs. And in those non-essential beliefs, we give Liberty. I'm going to give you an example of this. You have never seen two people argue until you go to a Bible college. I, I went to a Bible college, and when I got to Bible college, I, again, I've shared with you, church, that I'm a pastor's kid, and so I've grown up around the church. I've grown up around theological conversations. I've heard pastors through Sunday school and adult Bible fellowship and Awana. I, I, I've, I've been able to be exposed to awesome biblical teaching. Then you get to Bible college, and it goes to this whole nother level. Like, it would be normal for people in the 18 to 21-year-old range when they're having coffee with a friend to be talking about their favorite TV show, what car they want to buy, not covenant theology and dispensationalism, not reformed theology, not Arminianism. Like, those are not just like normal conversations for 18 to 21 year olds, but this is what happened when I was in Bible college. We would sit around our dorm and there'd be all these different people and guess how many of them would agree in 100% agreement? None. And you know where we learned it? Because in the classroom, with our theological professors that are the ones writing these books that we all read, guess how many of them agreed 100% on every theological principle? Zero. Church, this is why it's important that in essential beliefs, we have unity. And in non-essential beliefs, in some of the areas where as you poll pastors, theologians, the apostles, 
you would probably find that everybody has a little bit of a different perspective. Hence the gospels being written from different perspectives, illustrating to us the different components of the character and identity of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that in non-essentials, church, we have liberty. But in everything, we have charity. We can't lose the love, church. It is our love that leads us personally on this pursuit of truth. For me. Not for me to jam it down your throat. Or for me to sit around a college dormitory and say, I cannot believe you would believe that. Not even knowing the background you have. Or the family you grew up in. Remember a few weeks ago we said love leads to unity. If we're going to be united as a church, we have essential beliefs that we have unity around. And we have non-essential beliefs that we have liberty around. And in all things we have charity, love, respect, decency, the attitude and posture of Jesus Christ. As a church, we seek to believe, teach, and follow truth and to be faithful to that truth. That's the next point that John makes right here in John chapter 2. He says, love leads us to have a commitment to our church family. Love leads us to have a commitment to personally and corporately pursuing truth. And then we are faithful to that. Read along with me right here. It says this, so you must remain... Uh, he says it right there. We have a commitment to faithfulness. If you're online right now, NBC Online, faithfulness in the chat for me, please. This is what it says, faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. Remember, in 1 John, John keeps pointing back. He's like, all right, this is what Jesus taught you, and this is what I'm reminding you of. This is what I wrote you to in the Gospel of John. This is what I'm reminding you of now. This is what I taught you when I was there with you. This is what I'm reminding you now. There's nothing new. Sometimes as followers of Christ, we need like a lot of reminders. And John's giving that reminder right now, especially the longer we've been a follower of Christ. Sometimes we think the new believers need reminders. No, I need the reminders. Sometimes I can get just stuck and stale in my faith. I need God to just hit me upside the head and remind me of truth, remind me to be faithful. If you do... You will remain in what? Fellowship. This whole book, he keeps talking about this idea of fellowship, fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. Remember, he's writing to those who are already followers of Jesus. He's not saying that when you remain faithful, you receive justification or salvation. No, you've already received that as a follower of Christ. He's saying that the light, when it illuminates in our life, the areas of sin that we need to deal with, not that that's going to give us salvation and justification. No, it's going to give us fellowship. It's going to allow me to walk in the lifestyle that God has designed me to experience. God's plan and purpose for your life and for mine. When I think of this, I really think of an athlete. An athlete, when they go to the gym that they didn't cancel the membership at yet, they, they, they do the bicep curls, right? I think this is a, I'm, I am not a gym rat, if you can't tell. <laughs> this is a bicep curl, right? Okay. They do bicep curls. They do bench press. They do leg press. They do all of these different exercises, right? And there's this person, this athlete, maybe it's you. You go to the gym, and you go, and you go, and you go, and you see those gains, and you come home, you're like, hey, baby, what's up? Just got to fix my hair. You know, you're like putting on the gun show. All of a sudden this summer, you're like, take this shirt off. And you're like ready to dive in your pool because you've been working out really hard. You've been so faithful to preparing and to working out and preparing your body. Now, here's the question. When you stop being faithful to the gym, and to working out, what happens? You're right, you end up looking like me. Joke. No, when you're not faithful, you begin to lose those gains, right? You're like, okay, I could run in this time, I could bench press this amount, 
and as if you're faithful in your training, those numbers may increase, but those numbers may stay the same. But if you're not faithful in your training, I can guarantee you this, it's not gonna maintain. You're gonna lose it. You're not gonna experience the same blessings in the physique you had. This is what the faithfulness that I'm talking about is, church. When we remain faithful to the truth, to the fellowship with our brothers and sisters Christ, when we remain faithful to the love that we are called to experience, we will experience the life of purpose and significance. The fellowship with our Father, with one another, that we have been designed and intended to experience. Now, some of us are say, you know what? I haven't been faithful, but that's okay. This is not a point of judgment. This is not saying, well, well then don't bother starting. No, this is a point of beginning. This is a point of inspiration to say, you know what? I'm going to allow my love for my Savior to allow me to make a commitment to a body of believers, a church family. I'm going to allow my love for Jesus to set me on this eternal pursuit of truth. I'm going to allow my love for Jesus, my love for my brothers and sisters in Christ to cause me to be faithful, experiencing the fellowship with the Father. But in this entire story, we have to have a commitment to being led by the Holy Spirit. John, he continues on and he says this, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. And this, it's the Antichrist, those who are leading them away from Jesus. In our lives, there are plenty of people that would want to lead us astray. But you, as a follower of Christ, have received the Holy Spirit. Circle it, church. God has given you a gift. God has blessed you with God with us. God in us. And he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what it teaches is true. It's not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, when you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you, providing comfort, providing guidance, allowing you to understand the truth of God's plan for your life and the truth of his word. He's not giving you revelation that is contrary to his word or his character. He is guiding you in and through his word, his people. The Holy Spirit is at work inside of our lives. I like to think of it like this. When my, my kids come home from school, and, and especially when they're really young, because the older they get, the harder this principle gets. But when they're really young and they come home and they're like, Dad, one plus one, what is that equal? And I simply can answer two. I'm like, that's an easy one. Whew. When they start adding the letters in it, that's, I'm going to be in big trouble. When, when they come home and, and they say, all right, Dad, can, can you help me read this book? As a loving father, I sit down with them and I try to help them learn to read. When, when they're like, okay, is this the color red? And I'm like, no, Leah, that's blue. Oh, blue, okay. Like, that is, that is what I'm doing as a parent, is I'm helping them. And I'm not looking at Leah and being like, Leah, come on, you're three. You should know all your colors. Maybe I've been that way a few times, all right, because I'm broken, I'm flawed, but God is not. God is holy, he's righteous, he's perfect, and he is guiding us through his Holy Spirit. Whatever place you are in your walk with Christ, he is at work inside of your life, teaching, guiding you and I, and we must remain faithful and available to being led by God. It says this in James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Here's the sad part. I have met 
in my lifetime, some who've gotten to a place of finality in their faith. And what I mean by finality in their faith is this. They are no longer wanting, willing, or listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They got it all figured out. They have been to so many Bible studies, and they've studied it in the Greek and the Hebrew. They really have no use for the Holy Spirit anymore. They really have no desire to allow God to lead them in a new way. This is the danger, church, of us becoming head heavy and losing sight of our heart. We have to remain faithful to the leading of the Holy Spirit. God in us. But not only does God ask us to allow love to lead us, to make a commitment to his church, to truth, and to faithfulness, but God demonstrated that very same love to us. This isn't something that God didn't already do. God's love led him to John 3.16. This is this, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, fully God and fully man, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is God's commitment to his creation. God is not asking something of us more than what he has already done for us. God looked down at my broken life and this broken world, and his love led him to give of his very Son, for Jesus to leave the perfection of heaven, to come down to earth, to live in this broken and hurting and messed up place because he loves you and me, because of his commitment to you and to me. And maybe you're here today and you always saw God as just this like big bully up in the sky with a baseball stick, just like ready to just knock you down, just to take something away from you, just to beat you up. And maybe today you see that God is not just asking us to be faithful, but he's been faithful to you. He's demonstrated his love to you. So here's my question for you. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if you've not yet begun a relationship with Christ, that is the most important question you need to come up with an answer to. Do you say Jesus is a good teacher? A moral man? A rabbi? A fictional figure? Or do you say Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, God in the flesh, who came and died on the cross to pay the price for your sins and mine, who rose again, and is preparing a home for you, because if that is who you say Jesus is, then right now I want you to tell that to him. I want you to admit your brokenness, and I want you to repent and say, God, I am so sorry that I have contributed to the brokenness in this world, that I have not lived up to my own standards, and I definitely haven't lived up to your perfect standards, God. But today, I say who your son is. I believe in Jesus Christ. I put my faith and trust in him. God, will you forgive me? Will you begin a relationship with me? Will you allow your Holy Spirit to come in and guide me and allow me to follow you with my life? I ask everybody just to close your eyes just for a moment. As you do this, every one of us has, has one of two things we should be doing right now. Church, we are a place where those who do not yet have a relationship with Christ or believe in the existence of Jesus Christ, this is a safe place for that person. And my prayer is every single Sunday, whether at NBC Online or somewhere in this room, that there will be someone who has not yet begun a relationship with Christ. So every time you hear me at, lead this prayer, I'm asking every person who's a follower of Christ every weekend to have a heart for that person. So right now you are praying, you are pleading with God, saying, God, will you work in the lives of those in our community who do not yet have a relationship with you? But if you are here in this room, 
And when you heard me ask that question, who do you say Jesus is? You had an answer that you said Jesus is God in the flesh who paid the price for your sin and you wanna ask him to forgive you and begin a relationship with you? Then right now, I'm gonna ask you just to tell him that. He can hear your thoughts, he can feel your emotions. And right now in this moment, your eternal destination can be changed. You can become a part of the family of God and you can begin a relationship with your heavenly father. God, I, I'm so thankful for this church. And I'm so thankful for right now, if there is anyone that for the first time is beginning a relationship with you, God, let us be a church that will come alongside them and celebrate them and walk through this journey with them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I've, I have one last illustration that I want to share with this church. Because when, uh, when my beautiful wife Tracy and I, when we got married, she gave me something. She gave me this wedding ring. And I, I know you've heard me talk about it before, but she gave me this wedding ring. Now, this wedding ring is a symbol of her love. Her love for me led her to give me this wedding ring. So when I see this wedding ring, I can be reminded of the love my spouse has for me. But it also is a reminder of the commitment that she has made to me, to be faithful to me, to be truthful to me, to build a family with me, to be led by God together. So when I see this ring, I'm reminded of her love, her commitment. And so it's a great symbol. This does not define her love. This does not define her faithfulness. It's a symbol of those things. And the church has something else that is a symbol of us saying, I am committed to this body of believers. I am in alignment with their mission, what they believe God has called them to do in this community. I'm in alignment with their beliefs. I will live in unity around the essential beliefs. I will live in liberty around the non-essential beliefs. I will live in charity towards all. And, and this is something that the church has, uh, NBC has, that's called membership. Okay? Membership is not a higher class of Christianity. Membership gives you zero perks. Ask anybody who's a member. Membership is simply saying, I love this body. I love this church family. I am making a commitment to them in truth, in faithfulness, in being led by the Holy Spirit. And so members here at NBC, they come forward and they just say, I want to learn more. And it needs to start there. Don't become a member without knowing what we believe, with what we're all about, with where we're going. But once we've learned those things, we have the ability for you to say, okay, I'm in agreement with those things. I want to move from being a consumer, sitting in the seat every Sunday, wondering what the pastor's gonna talk about, to being a contributor. I am sent by God to fulfill a purpose. I'm gonna worship him in my giving. I'm gonna give him my acts of service. I'm gonna invite people to begin a relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna live as a part of this body of believers. And those are the things that we talk about inside of this membership class. And, and I'm so excited because today, I get to introduce some people who have done just that. They have said, I have heard everything this church is about. I am going to have essential, in the essential beliefs, I'm gonna have unity. In the non-essential beliefs, I'm gonna have liberty. In all things, I'm gonna demonstrate love. I'm gonna be about the mission of this church. I'm making a commitment to truth, to faithfulness, to being led by the Holy Spirit. And so if you are one of our brand new members, I'm gonna ask you, would you come on up here and come join me up here on the stage? Come on up. They're all from all different sides. Absolutely. <laughs> I got you, we'll make sure you're good. I love that applause, that was awesome. Thank you, church. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is again, this is not about glorifying them. Again, this is not some higher level of member or of, of person at NBC. This is not some higher level of Christianity. This is simply a group of people who said, okay, we're all in. We're a part of this church family. And they got to ask their questions. They got to be a part of this. And so I'm actually gonna ask each one of you to, to just share your name with us 
and secondly, how long you've been attending MBC, okay? Sound good? We're gonna start right over here. Here you go, brother. Uh, my name is Chimwemwe Kaonga, but just call me Chim. I've been coming to this church for a little over a year. My name is Christine Japala. I have also been coming here for about over a year. I'm Katie Mackis. We've been coming to this church for like two and a half years. Yeah. You're up. I'm Luke Mackis. I've been coming here for two and a half years. Hi, my name is Maggie, Maggie Hall. And I have been coming back since about February. But I am a previous member, so thank you. Uh, I'm Nancy Jaycott, and it will be a year this summer that I've been. Church, we're going to pray right now. And we're going to just celebrate the fact that God is continuing to be at work in our church family, that we are continuing to live out the love that God has given to us in significant ways. And we're going to celebrate the commitment that you have all made. And so let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for each person that shares the stage with me right now. I'm so thankful for every person that's gone before them that has agreed with them and has said, I want to publicly commit to saying, I am a follower of Jesus, and I would desire to be a part of this church family. God, I pray that you will continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit, that you will continue to give us unity, that you will continue to allow us to be faithful to the things that you have called your followers of Christ to be faithful to, and that, God, we will individually and corporately pursue truth. God, I, I do pray your blessing on each of these people, that as they've taken this step of faith, I know that commitment is a word that we much would rather oftentimes say is cancel. God, I pray that you would just bless their commitment, not, not to me, not to this building, not to this service, but to your bride, the church, and to you as their heavenly father. That God, as they live out their commitment, as they contribute, that God, you would just show them the blessing of what you are doing in and through them in every season, in every stage of life, in seasons of blessing and seasons of less. God, I pray that they will experience your presence and that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide and direct. God, I ask this not just for, for each of these people, but for our entire church family. God, let us be all about you. Let us make you famous, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Can we give them one more round of applause, church? So as they're returning to their seats, I'm hoping there might be one person here, maybe two, maybe a couple, maybe an individual, and you're saying, okay, so if love leads us to commitment, I'm kind of the low commitment type of person. I'm more the cancel Netflix, cancel the gym membership. I'm more like I show up when I show up, you get what you get kind of person. And this is a good place for you because we've all been there. But maybe today you're saying, you know what? I feel like I'm supposed to take a next step. I'm supposed to find out a little bit more about who this body of believers is. And maybe God's asking me to take a next step forward in my pursuit of him. And so, if you have your church center app, the, the Mesa Baptist Church Church Center app, you can pull it up right now. And right there, you will see under the events tab that we have an upcoming membership class. Now, I am not asking you to be a member. I want that to be just be perfectly clear. I'm asking you if you feel led to go to this class so you can learn about this church family. And as you learn and you hear who we are and what we believe and what we're all about, that you'll have a very heartfelt conversation with God and say, God, is this the church family for me? And I, I mean this church with all my heart. If God answers that with no, I am 100% okay with that. You go find the church that God says yes to. But if God says yes, I want you to make a commitment to this church family. And I'm asking that you follow the Holy Spirit's leading. You say, I'm gonna move from a consumer to a contributor 
and I'm going to publicly let my brothers and sisters in Christ know I have made a commitment to this body of believers. And so you can register right now. It's coming up here in a few weeks. And so I'm excited to see what God is going to continue to do as we prepare for baptisms in July, as we prepare for Summerama this week, as we get excited about all God's going to do. But will we stand up? Let's worship God because this is all about Him. We exist in Him, for Him, and everything we do is through Jesus Christ. Let's worship together, church.